Uh, topic tonight, as I mentioned, is donor eggs. And if you're using donor eggs, should you do pre-implantation genetic testing? So I want to go back a little bit to the history of genetic testing for embryos. Way back in the beginning, they first started with just doing uh, pre-implantation genetic testing for embryos on day three. And very quickly they realized that by removing one whole you know, cell from a developing embryo, that this was quite damaging to embryos. So then they developed the idea of biopsying the trophectoderm, which is the tissue that becomes the placenta later on, uh, around day five, or sometimes on day six. And so the idea behind this was you wait till the embryo gets to blastocyst stage. Some people on day three and some people on day five were laser hatching the embryo. So you zap the embryo with the laser, give it a little hole, and you do it right where the trophectoderm, which is the tissue that will later become the placenta, is developing. Why? Because no one wanted to zap the part that's becoming the baby. We don't know what the impact of that will be when it's multiple cells. But they felt it was probably safe to take a piece of placenta because placenta is pretty resilient. So they wait till the tissue that is inside uh, the embryo starts to extrude through that hole and you get this little ballooned out part of the embryo and that part is the part that they take the laser again and they actually kind of trim off a piece of that tissue. That tissue then gets sent for processing and analysis and the lab can tell you if you have a genetically normal trophectoderm or not. Now, the uh, congruence between the trophectoderm and the embryo is fairly high, but it's not 100%, so there can be errors. And in particular, I'm sure many of you have heard about the whole topic of mosaic embryos, where some of the cells are normal, some of them are not in the trophectoderm, and does that impact the actual success rate of the whole uh, process? And can you get a normal embryo from a mosaic um, reading and can you have a normal child from that? And the answer in short for that part of it is yes, you can. So the idea was let's see if we can detect which embryos are clearly going to be abnormal. If we start dropping off those embryos and only take the normal ones, we should be able to improve your chances. So that's kind of the history behind this. Now, there is a recent article that has shown that doing the embryo on a biopsy on day three is not as good as doing the embryo biopsy on day five, and that maybe we should wait till the embryos are further advanced before we laser hatch them. And there are other previous articles which have also suggested that you may be damaging the embryos a little bit by doing these biopsies. And on top of that, that not only you may not be improving the success rates, sometimes you may even be compromising them. There is a study that we reviewed on the show probably about two years ago now called the STAR trial, S-T-A-R, where they had kind of a multinational, multi-center study, randomized controlled trial, comparing doing PGTA in patients that were going through IVF, and they explored it based on age of the people that were receiving the eggs. Now they weren't looking at egg donors, these were all autologous cycles, and in that study, they demonstrated that there was no benefit. And in fact, even further into it, other people were reanalyzing it, saying it was even worse than the authors were reporting it to be, and they had already said it didn't help. Some people were saying that it was actually potentially even harmful and that there was really absolutely no benefit to doing it. So the reason this subject has become kind of more important for me personally on the donor side of things was we get a lot of European clients who are needing egg donors. Oftentimes they're either single or couples of gay men. Um, and then we have our own couples here where the woman has tried several times and it hasn't worked. Or again, our, our same-sex male couples or, or single male couple, uh, individuals here that need an egg donor and are always being told by some of the other centers or other exploration that they've done that they need to do PGTA. So the question for me was, well, you know, we don't recommend that to them. And is there evidence to support the fact that we don't recommend it? And I, I always knew there was, but we hadn't reviewed it on the show. So I thought I'd bring it to your attention because if you're looking at an egg donor cycle and you're being told you need to do PGTA, you should be aware of whether or not you need it.
So this article is from 2020, October 15th, so just about six, seven months ago. And it's called Donor Oocyte Recipients Do Not Benefit from Pre-Implantation Genetic Testing for Aneuploidy to Improve Pregnancy Outcomes. So um, the fact or fiction is in the title this time. So essentially what they did here, and we'll go to uh, figure one if you can pull that up with the little people. Um, they commented on the fact that right now donor egg cycles are uh, representing a huge number of cycles. 22,000 donor egg cycles were done in the U.S. in 2016, and it's, that represented 9% of all cycles done there. So it's a, it's a really growing, very large part of the IVF wor world or sphere. So essentially what they wanted to do was look at uh, using frozen eggs, which is admittedly different from fresh, but nevertheless still a valid experiment, and they had a really great model for it. So they took the donor eggs and they took 12 from each donor and they split it between the two groups with one group being the group where they received the PGTA representing the 262 women and the other group being the group that did not get PGTA which was 1,029 women. So all told there were 1,291 cycles um, essentially, they were looking at this in the sense of let's take the same population of eggs, split it between two groups, do PGTA on some, don't do PGTA on the others, and then let's compare them. So this is a really great way to analyze this. Admittedly, it was not a randomized controlled trial. This is a retrospective paired cohort where they matched the people that received eggs from the same donor and then compared them within those two groups. So the, the patients going through the donor egg cycles went through a pretty standard protocol. The eggs were frozen um, first and then people would select them. And they obviously controlled for the confounding factors like age and BMI and all of these things. So, so these were all really important to make sure that you've got comparable groups. So what they found, the age of the patients was relatively the same, average around 42 years of age. Um, the donor's age was about 25 and a bit, um, and it was all pretty much kind of the same, and there were no real significant differences in any of their other characteristics. The one interesting thing from this that they did go into was that in the PGTA group, most people tended to just get one embryo, there was a small number that had more than one, in the non-PGTA group, there was a statistically significant higher number of people getting more than one embryo, so two or more. And that's really important because obviously the more embryos you put in, possibly the higher the chances are going to be. But again, even if you look at national guidelines, if they're not PGT PGTA tested, some people will allow you or some guidelines do suggest putting in more embryos because you know some of them will be abnormal. Okay, so what did they end up with? Well, on average, 2.9 embryos were frozen or available per um, couple that went through this. In total, 43% um, of the embryos were euploid, meaning genetically normal, and 12.7% of the patients had no usable embryos whatsoever. So you can see this on uh, figure two with this little bar graph. And the bar graph shows that about 43%, like I said, had all of the embryos be normal. And way out on the other side, about 12% had no embryos that were normal, almost 13%. In between all of that, the average rate, um, about 87.3% of patients had at least one genetically normal embryo, which was good. And there was quite a bit of variation, they report, between the centers that they did this in because they, they had, a, I think, 47 different places that uh, contributed to the study. But overall, they said that 75% um, to 78.6% were uh, demonstrating that there were normal embryos present. 
um, and, and giving you a very good sort of overall chance that there was something reasonable there. Okay, so we're going to go to figure three. So this is the difference in live births. And in the red, it's all of the number of embryo transfers. And the blue is the first embryo transfer. So you can see that between the PGTA group, which is the first bar, and the no PGTA group, there is no statistically significant difference on the first or during all transfer cycles for the outcomes. So in other words, doing PGTA offered no benefit because it did not improve your chances of a successful live birth. If anything, it's even a lower number, but that is not statistically significant. So there was no difference in this study. Now, could it be that because they transferred in more embryos, um, they got a better result? It is possible. And you would expect that to be a problem if they were ending up with a higher order, uh, a higher number, I'm sorry, of twins. And they did have a little bit higher rate um, in that sense. So it was 3.4% in the PGTA group and it was 9.8% in the non-PGTA group. So yes, they were seeing a little bit of a higher number, but again, if you're doing that reasonable uh, sort of distribution of the number of embryos you're putting in there, they're not seeing a benefit here. It is cheating a little bit though. The best study would have been single embryo transfer, single embryo transfer, so that you really could tell the differences. The other part that they looked at was in figure four. So if we flip over to figure four, again, in the blue, you've got the first embryo transfer cycle. In the red, you've got all of them. And here they looked at the pregnancy loss defined as a biochemical and clinical pregnancy loss together, or so and or, after the first transfer, transfer cycle within the same recipient. So. Again, in the PGTA group, they saw a um, norm, like the same number, there was no statistically significant difference compared to the PGTA, uh, non-PGTA group. So they got the exact same results. Now you will see a little bit of a difference in the groups there, but they were again, not statistically significantly different. When they looked at all the transfer cycles, a little bit higher, but it's still the same thing. And again, there was no statistically significant difference. So they essentially <clears throat> concluded in their study that there was no difference in the outcomes of uh, you know, these, these patients that were getting PGTA. So for those of you that are looking at doing an egg donor cycle and you're being told that you have to do PGTA, there is certainly no current evidence that supports the idea that you're gonna get a better outcome from this. Now, granted, it's unusual here for us to ever ever put in two donor egg-derived embryos into anybody because we get very, very high success rates with just one. But I don't think we would get any significant benefit from putting in embryos that were tested with PGTA. My heart does go out to those of you who have had a donor egg cycle and have ended up with genetically abnormal embryos. That is challenging emotionally, psychologically, and financially, because now you have to go through the whole process again, potentially. And if you're using a surrogate, even more so. However, the rates are so low using a young donor, as you could see from this, that the reality is it's unlikely you're gonna end up with genetically abnormal embryos the majority of patients have all of their embryos be normal and the vast majority have at least one. So is it really going to benefit you to go through the PGTA when it could potentially be detrimental? Certainly not. There is no advantage to doing so and there's certainly no evidence to support that approach to things. So essentially, is it a fact or a fiction that you need PGTA for donor embryos? It appears to be a fiction. You do not need donor or PGTA when you're using donor eggs as the source of your embryo creation because it does not appear to be a benefit. Now, again, we probably need a better done st uh, study where they're comparing apples to apples, which would be single embryo transfer and single embryo transfer. And that doesn't exist yet, but I'm sure someone's working on it and hopefully we'll be able to bring that to you soon.